Good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm Fraser. Um, my Twitter handle's up there. And I am going to tell you about the uh, Let's Encrypt initiative and the ACME protocol, uh, which underlies it and uh, how it does its thing. So uh, first, a bit about me. I'm a developer at Red Hat. Uh, I work on the dog tag certificate system, which is a certificate authority and uh, OCSP responders, token management systems, and so on, and the free IPA identity management suite. At work, uh, I'm mainly using Java uh, for dog tag and Python for free IPA. But uh, for my side projects and, and outside of work, I'm mainly writing Haskell these days. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about deploying TLS and what it takes to do that securely today. And uh, I'm going to talk about the Let's Encrypt initiative, which is hoping to uh, provide a better way of doing that. Uh, and I will uh, briefly explain the mechanics of the ACME protocol. Um, there will be a live demo, uh, which I haven't checked if it still works, so hopefully it still works. And uh, then I'm going to conclude with a discussion uh, of some of the uh, implementation and security considerations and some possible future directions for the initiative and for the ACME protocol. So deploying TLS. Uh, first of all, can I just have a show of hands of anyone who has not ever um, done a certificate request and domain validation with a public CA in order to deploy TLS. Has anyone um, not done that? Like how many people? So there's only a few. Most people uh, in the room appear to um, have uh, suffered the trauma of, of doing that. <laughs> um, so basically the process today involves um, paying money to a certificate authority. Um, usually there are some free ones, um, but most of them charge money. That's, a, that's point zero because that one doesn't necessarily happen as the first step, um, but the next three are in order. So you have to prove control of a domain um, for a domain validation certificate, which is an ad hoc process. There is no standardization around this process. Um, then you have to request a certificate, and there are many different um, certificate request formats and uh, processes for actually getting that certificate request to the certificate authority or CA and getting a certificate back. And finally, once you've uh, acquired the certificate, you have to configure the server software to use that certificate. Um, and this is a, typically a non-trivial process. Um, so I've just got some screenshots of uh, what some of the public CAs say about domain validation. So yeah, validation of domain ownership is acquired through a link that you need to click on being emailed to you in your email address. Um, associated with the domain. Um, there are some alternative ways to do it, uploading a file to your website's root or uh, creating a, a CNAME record in the domain name system, DNS. Um, but yeah, the whole like click on a link being emailed thing just fills me with um, <laughs> concern the moment I see it. Um, there are ways to do it securely. Uh, I'm willing to bet that at least a few of the CAs out there are not doing it securely. Um, here's another one, Network Solutions. Um, they say that domain validation is done using an established and accepted um, process. Well, established, yeah, kind of. Like, there are some common ad hoc ways of doing it, but there's no formalization whatsoever of the domain validation process and no convenient way to automate it. Um, and accepted, uh, accepted by whom? Accepted by those who can tolerate doing it. Um, uh, I'm willing to bet that there are a lot of people who have not deployed TLS because they just gave up in frustration. People who uh, weren't necessarily sysadmins or, or um, people experienced in these technologies who just throw their hands up in the air and say, oh, it's too hard, you know, I'll just serve it insecurely. Um, it's not, not a good state of affairs. Uh, we can do a lot better. Um, but let's look at the certificate request process. So um, if you're on a Unix machine, you uh, issue a magical incantation, um, you know, open SSL, rec, no DES, new key, blah, 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 um, wat. Like, um, you can read the man page and find out what this means. If you're like me, you've done this many, many times, but you still have to look at the man page every time you want to do it to uh, work out what was the magical incantation that you, that you had to issue. Um, make sure you put the right information into the right fields. You know, the domain name is actually the common name in the distinguished name. And, you know, if you don't know that, if you're lucky, your certificate authority will detect that in the request and say, well, you seem to have made a mistake there. 
If you're unlucky, they'll just issue a certificate with, com with completely, whoa. <laughs> just had a, uh, a light explode over there. Um, <laughs> um, if you're unlucky, they'll issue you a certificate with just completely bogus information that the browsers won't accept. Um, and then uh, having done all this, you just open up the file and copy and paste it into a field in the web browser. And again, um, this is just annoying. Um, there's way too much involved um, than there necessarily needs to be. Um, for configuring the server, you've got to configure the certificate chain. Oh, we've got some smoke blowing past now. Um, <laughs> great. Um, and uh, different servers have different configuration for the certificate chain. Some of them have the end entity certificate um, configured you know, it's in its own file and then the rest of the chain in another file. And again, there are a bunch of different formats. Um, the default TLS configuration in uh, most server software is, uh, in this day and age, uh, insecure or at least uh, inadequate. Um, if you look on the web for, you know, how, how, what are the correct TLS settings? Well, too bad if you looked at anything that's, you know, six months old or older than that, um, because you, if you do what it says in the article, you won't be deploying TLS securely. And then you got this. SSL ciphers directive and this great big thing, which is like, that's, that's crazy. Like, it's what you need to do to deploy TLS securely today. Um, but, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be this difficult. Um, so that's kind of what the Let's Encrypt initiative is, um, is all about. So Let's Encrypt is an initiative to encrypt um, the whole web. It's being driven by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Mozilla, the Akamai uh, CDN mob, Cisco, who make network equipment. Um, I'm sure most of you know this, and, and Identrust, who are a uh, public certificate authority uh, with their root in the trust stores of most browsers uh, and operating systems today. They're going to provide a free certificate authority, and they're going to provide ways to uh, automate domain validation and certificate installation. Um, and the way that's all going to work is using the ACME protocol, and I will... Uh, delve into a bit of an in-depth look at ACME in just a couple of slides. First, let's talk about what some non-goals are. Um, this is not a replacement for the X509 PKI or the certificate cartel. Um, you can still give money to a certificate authority if you want to uh, have a higher level of validation, if you want to pay for an EV cert. So you <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Exactly. So, I mean, and it's the experience for a, a user on the computer is no different at all. A DV a domain validation certificate will be accepted by a browser. So, you know, what's the big deal? Well, they just want to, you know, shake down large companies twice. Um, well, okay, everyone wants more money, so fine. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's easy to look at it and, and be disgusted um, by the industry at the moment. Um, it's not intended for automating or replacing these higher forms of validation. And again, uh, you know, if your eyebrow is raised by that um, sentence, well, that, that's okay. Um, mine is too, but we need to talk about what the goals of the project are and are not, so that's not one of them. And uh, it's not intended to be useful in private or institutional deployments uh, of X509, although it turns out that the um, client automation of um, certificate installation and configuration of server software will probably end up being useful in those sorts of environments. The ACME protocol itself, um, perhaps not, but uh, we'll see. So ACME stands for Automated Certificate Management Environment. Um, there's provision in the protocol for the automation of domain validation via the uh, issuance of challenges by a certificate authority to a client, and the client will um, do some work in response to those challenges, send some data back to the server in order to um, have the server validate that um, the client has control of a particular domain that they're interested in acquiring certificates for. Um, it manages the certificate life cycle, so you can request new certificates, renew certificates, and re uh, revoke them. And finally, although it's not actually part of the protocol, um, an important part of this initiative is that the clients will automatically c configure um, the server software and install the certificates uh, in the manner that is appropriate to the server that's being configured. So, brief overview of the protocol. A client will uh, generate an account key pair. Um, it will uh, 
with that account key pair, ask the, uh, the server for um, some challenges to validate a domain, and it will satisfy those challenges or attempt to do so. Um, and having satisfied them, the account key is then authorized to request and revoke certificates uh, for that domain name. There's a REST-ish API, API um, with the protocol. And uh, finally, Bez mentioned the client request objects are always signed using the account key, um, using the JWS, JSON Web Signature um, object format. Key registration looks uh, something like this. So you uh, post to some new registration resource um, an object that contains some contact details signed by the account key. Um, the contact URIs are used for recovery and or notifications of account events. And uh, there'll be a location header in the response that will allow a client to update the contact details should they change. Um, and there'll also be uh, link headers which will uh, inform the client as to where to go to um, request authorization uh, for a particular domain name. That's what uh, this slide's about. So you can post to uh, new auth said. Now this is not actually specified by the protocol, which is why those link headers are important. But I imagine that most implementations will standardize around a common set of paths. Um, so it'll post an identifier, type DNS value, um, the domain name. Um, this structure is um, designed such that uh, the protocol could be um, extended for other use cases, but at the moment there's only one type defined, and that's uh, DNS for domain names. You'll get back a, uh, an object that looks something like this. So you'll get a pending uh, authorization for the identifier, as was included in the request. Um, and a particular account key, and this is pulled from the JWS header. And then a series of challenges. Um, in this case, there are, th there are three challenges. Uh, one is simple HTTPS, one is DNS. We'll look at each of them in a minute. Um, one is recovery token. I'm not going to explain that one today, but you can read the spec if you're interested. And finally, combinations, um, which is basically saying the server policy around which um, sets of authorizations will, uh, or which set of validations will constitute an authorization um, should those validations pass. So in this case, either index zero, simple HTTPS and recovery token, or DNS and recovery token will satisfy the server as to the um, control over the domain that the client has, <coughs> excuse me, that the client has. Um, there are six validation challenges at the moment. More may emerge. Um, so there's simple HTTPS, which is basically um, a formalization of the, hey, just um, put a file on your website somewhere, and we'll go and check that you put that file with some certain contents. DVSNI, which is domain validation by server name indication, um, which has the client sign a custom certificate and then uh, set up a host within the server software such that um, when the server contacts that host with a particular value in the server name indication TLS extension, the server will respond um, with this custom certificate, which will contain the information that the server will uh, validate. So, and when I say uh, sorry, when I say server here, I'm talking about the ACME server, so the certificate authority. Um, then there's DNS, which is provisioning a particular DNS record for the domain. Um, these uh, three final ones, proof of possession, which is used to prove control of a already trusted key, and that's um, already trusted by the ACME certificate authority. For example, if you already have your, uh, a certificate signed by VeriSign, and if the um, ACME server trusts VeriSign, then they might say, okay, well, if, if VeriSign signed you, then we'll sign you too. Um, then there's recovery uh, contact and recovery token for handling um, lost um, account keys and so on. A simple HTTPS uh, challenge looks like this. So you have, well, type simple HTTPS and a token, um, which is just some ASCII with minimum 128 bits of entropy. Um, the client has to um, put this content in a file, which it will serve up using text plane. And um, the client can choose where it puts it on the server as long as it's under the path dot well known slash acme challenge. Um, it decides the rest of the path and it includes 
um, that path in the response. When the uh, ACME CA receives the response, um, it can go uh, hit the server and try and request this file, make sure that the uh, content is in the file, um, and if it all checks out, then that validation has passed. DVS and I is a bit more complex. Um, is that, actually, it's a lot more complex. Um, the challenge contains um, R, which is a 32-byte random octet string, base64 encoded, and a nonce, which is a 16-byte octet string, uh, random 16-byte octet string, uh, hex encoded. Um, upon receipt of the challenge, if the client chooses to respond to this challenge, um, the client will then generate S, which is also a random 32-byte octet string, base64 encoded. Um, that it will include in its response. Um, now it provisions a host on the server at nonce, so it's this value here, dot acme dot invalid, and it signs a uh, custom certificate um, self-signed using the uh, account key with a subject alt name extension containing two domain names, one being the domain that is being validated and the other being um, this thing dot acme dot invalid where this thing is um, the hex encoding of the SHA-256 digest of the concatenation of the um, server nonce and the client nonce R and S. Now when the server um, receives the response, it will contact um, the server, commence a TLS handshake. It will use um, this host name in the server name uh, indication extension and uh, it will examine the certificate it receives back um, and check these um, aspects. So it'll check that um, it has subject alt name with the domain name being validated and um, the appropriate this thing, dot acme dot invalid. DNS fortunately is a fair bit simpler. Um, you just get a token and you have to provision a text record um, for dot uh, underscore, ac underscore acme challenge uh, dot domain being validated in txt and then this value. And uh, there's actually no additional information included in the response to the ACME CA. Um, it just says, hey, I've, I've responded to your challenge. Um, you can go and, and check um, that the record exists now. If it does, and if the uh, value matches the token, then uh, that validation is passed. Um, as I said, the, uh, the other three, proof of possession, um, recovery, contact and recovery token, I'm not going to go into, but they're specified in the document, and uh, there's some links uh, at the end of the presentation. So assuming uh, enough validations have been passed to satisfy the server policy, uh, you can now post to a new cert resource. Again, this is not fixed in, in the protocol itself, but it's something that it can be discovered via link headers in, uh, in earlier request response cycles. Um, the new certificate request contains a CSR and a list of the authorization URLs that the client has responded to. And again, this is all signed by the account key. Um, the CSR is a PKCS10 DER object, base64 URL encoded. Um, a client can request a certificate for multiple validated identifiers, so any identifiers that have been validated um, for that account key um, can be included in the certificate and they just can appear in the subject alternative name uh, extension. And if this is all successful, uh, then the server will respond 201. It must include a location header to a resource where it can retrieve the certificate. Um, and it may also include the certificate in the response directly to save a round trip. Um, revocation involves posting um, a revoke message um, to this resource here that was given in the location header. So again, it's very resty in terms of none of the um, paths are actually fixed. They should all just be learnt along the way by the client. Um, so you post to this resource um, the revoke message, revoke now, which is an RFC 3339 date, or the literal string now, um, and the relevant authorizations. And um, alternatively, you may sign this with the key that is on the certificate rather than the account key. And uh, if um, the server is satisfied with the authorization of the ACME client to issue the uh, revocation request for the uh, certificate, then uh, it will just respond 200 and that certificate will be revoked and appear in CRLs or uh, OCSP responses accordingly. Okay, um, 
So I hope you're still uh, holding on after that um, little bit of a deep dive, so it's demo time. So I'm just going to uh, run a demo server using a CA um, that I've created. So this is not using the public demo CA, but there is a public demo CA you can use. <coughs> OK, so this is running, and um, this is just spitting out the details of the certificate. Um, I have installed this CA certificate uh, in my browser. So when I uh, do do the uh, ACME request and the certificate is deployed, um, we're not going to get an error. Um, oh, don't do that to me. Um, uh, OK. Just bear with me a moment. Right. Um, yeah, well, it's not going to be a demo if something doesn't go wrong, right? Um, so this is just, well, it's just a flat file. Um, hello, Brisbane. Um, on crikey.ipa.local. Um, there isn't actually an IPA called Crikey IPA because I work on free IPA. Um, that's all. Um, so don't read into the domain name too much. Um, but yeah, this is being served uh, over HTTP. There's no security um, at this point. So if I go HTTPS. Um, hit that. Well, we'll see that the port's open, but um, we're, actually, we're not talking TLS at all. Um, so there's no certificate for this. The TLS isn't set up properly. Um, OK. So um, now this is on the uh, web server. And I have a uh, Acme client here. So if I do uh, sudo, which let's encrypt. Uh, Yep, and I'll say uh, server acme.ipa.local. So this is the host that's uh, running the Acme server, this chap over here. And domains, crikey.ipa.local. And I'll uh, put in my password. OK, so um, it's going to fire up the Acme client. This is a preview release, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, this software cannot obtain a publicly trusted certificate for your web server. Well, not yet. Um, that's OK, because I can still show the demo. So now it's doing the DVSNI challenge um, and creating the vhosts and all of that and the Apache. And yeah, it's, it's done. Um, so if I go back here now and reload this, uh, voila, we're serving this over HTTPS. Um, So verified by yeah, Acme Demo CA, so this is the CA that I've created um, and I've in installed its uh, certificate in my browser. And yeah, if we view it, uh, details, well, yeah, there's the chain. Uh, hmm, okay. Um, it's also going to uh, give us the option to do some other server configuration and make a permanent redirect from the HTTP site to the secure site. So yeah, we can turn that on, and that's just going to set up a uh, 301 permanent redirect. Um, so if we go to, say, uh, uh, Apache 2, sites enabled. So um, crikey.conf. So this was what was here before. Um, so the vhost, server name crikey.ipa.local document root bar dub dub dub. Um, this stuff here has just been added by the Acme client to set up this rewrite rule. And uh, for like, let's encrypt SSL.conf. Um, so you can see uh, if module mod SSL, server name and document root, same as before. And uh, SSL certificate file, um, well, let's encrypt 6.pem, let's encrypt 15.pem for the certificate key file. So as you can see, I've run this demo <laughs> a few times before. Um, and then including the default um, TLS configuration, which will be used by all the hosts. Um, currently, the Acme client doesn't update this if uh, 
if, for example, a new release comes out and they've updated the default TLS configuration, I don't think it is going to go and update this at this point, but there's, there's no reason why it couldn't. Okay. So how are we doing for time? Uh, how much time have I got? Five. Five minutes? Okay. So what's the status of the initiative? Um, the client and the server are still under heavy development, um, and the ACME protocol is still evolving. This uh, demo code I'm running is actually before they changed from a RPC-based API to the REST API, so it's quite old, but oh yeah, I didn't want to touch it because then um, I'd probably be um, running around in circles trying to get a working demo for my talk. Um, the, there's an Nginx configurator in the works as well. Um, currently, that only works for Apache. And uh, they're aiming for a mid-2015 launch of the public CA. In terms of the protocol evolution, uh, the original protocol was RPC-based. As I mentioned, they've moved to a REST-ish interface. Um, this does change the security characteristics. For example, there are more HTTP uh, resources exposed on the server, which means more endpoints where you're going to have to check authentication and authorization um, of the credentials that are presented by a client. Um, and in fact, there are some concerning aspects in the protocol now where, for example, with the registration resource, there's a, you know, the server should not respond to a GET request for a registration resource. Well, that really ought to be a must not because depending on how the registration resource paths are assigned, you know, if they're sequential, that means that if a server does actually allow people to get them, then you, you can just walk through and just mine all of the contact details off the server. So, yeah, there's, I think, a, a bit more work that needs to be done in the protocol to make it actually um, secure in all respects. Um, finally, uh, it's worth mentioning that they switched from a custom signature construction, which also was not entirely secure, um, to the JSON web signature construction um, at the same time as they moved from the RPC protocol to REST. So they did take that opportunity to make some, some other major positive changes to the protocol. Um, the future. So in terms of adoption, I'd like to see support for all the popular HTTP servers. So um, on Unix, that's going to be you know, Apache, Nginx, um, Lighty, L-I-G-H-T-T-P-D. Goodness knows how you actually pronounce that. Um, IIS for Windows. Um, I don't know what other servers there are. Maybe uh, some of them big uh, application servers as well. Um, I'd like to see support from multiple public CAs for the protocol, even paid ones, even though the, the payment would be uh, out of band. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no provision in the protocol for any sort of payment step. But um, the protocol itself, I think, is quite useful in terms of the formalization of the domain validation and the certificate um, request and, and uh, revocation lifecycle. So I think that there would be uh, a lot of value in um, existing CAs adopting this protocol in terms of the user experience and seeing TLS deployed in more places. And finally, uh, uptake by platform as a service providers um, I think would be a huge win because it means uh, as soon as the DNS is pointed to the PaaS provider, if you're using a custom domain, that PaaS provider can then go and provision uh, a valid certificate um, for that domain on behalf of its user. I think that's a huge win. Um, and for infrastructure as a service, um, they will actually control the DNS, usually. So there's even less work to do um, for a user um, such that they can get valid um, host certificates, for example, that will be accepted you know, across the board by uh, existing software. We might see some new validation challenges. Um, they've flagged DNSSEC um, email and who is. Um, I think DNSSEC is really the, the main interesting one there. Um, other side effects, if the initiative is successful, um, we will probably see better server configuration mechanisms or APIs. Um, that's a huge win, and that would also enable um, other benefits, like, for example, um, if you have a, serv a trusted service that uh, um, tells you what, what is the secure way to deploy TLS today, um, then you could have a service that goes and just checks that periodically um, or waits for a poll and then goes and updates the server. So when Heartbleed comes along or when you know, Beast comes along and suddenly, oh crap, I have to turn off TLS compression, that sort of thing could happen automatically. Um, the CA cartel might not like this initiative. <laughs> Will we see countermeasures? Will we see something like EV, um, you know, some 
uh, new, round, new round of hand wringing over how can we get people to still pay us money, uh, we might. Will we see attacks against the uh, Let's Encrypt CA or the protocol itself? Yeah, we might see what the future holds. Um, okay, so that, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Uh, you can get involved. Um, there's like, you know, all the codes on GitHub and there's IRC and all that, but this is the main one you need to remember. Let's encrypt.org, um, everything else, the mailing list, etc. Um, you can find from there. Okay, that's all. Are there any questions?